Today's episode of The Bitcoin Show is brought to you by Mt. Gox and Thank You Economy Book and MemoryDealers.com. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Bitcoin Show. I'm Bruce Wagner, as you know, and uh, today we have really big news. You may have walked past a newsstand and seen the December issue of Wired Magazine. Well, uh, right here, it's all about Bitcoin. So, uh, it's an article called The Rise and Fall of Bitcoin by a man named Benjamin Wallace. And those of you in the New York Bitcoin community probably know him, but he's our guest today. Welcome, Ben. Thanks, Bruce. Good How to be here. You? Good, thanks. You're good? Yeah? Yep. I, uh, wow. Um, you t were basically an embedded journalist into the Bitcoin community here in New York, right? I mean, you were hanging out at all the meetups and yep. the, con the convention, the conference, yep. everything. Yep. You, do you always get so immersed in your uh, story? When I have the luxury to time-wise and also when the subject is so interesting that I mm -hmm. want to spend as much time in it as I can, and, and, and Bitcoin was one of the most interesting stories I've worked on in a while. And how long did you work on writing this story? Um, I mean, the actual writing of it, maybe a week, but the reporting and research was several months. Several months um, yeah. I'm trying to, probably three months. That's like what that. I thought, yeah. about three months. Yeah. Just research and note-taking and all that. And then yeah, just talking to a lot of people, coming mm -hmm. to your meetups, coming to the uh, convention, um, you know, buying some bitcoins and playing around with them to mm -hmm. sort of see what it was like to buy them, to see what it was like to use them and store them, um, and just expose myself to bitcoin in as many different ways as I could. Cool. So, I mean, you know, obviously I look at you as a friend because you're just like another one of the bitcoin guys here in New York. I mean, everybody knows you here, uh, but uh, people, obviously people around the world may not have seen you yet, <laughs> uh, only your name. But the, uh, I was going to say, how had you heard of Bitcoin before, like were you assigned this story or did you pitch this story? I was assigned this story. Assigned I'd, this story. I'd never heard of Bitcoin. Really? Um, I, am, I write about all different sorts of things, not tech specifically. I mean, I've written for Wired before, but not a lot. And my editor said, hey, have you heard of Bitcoin? And I said no, and he started telling me about it and it sounded so interesting mm. um, that I was excited to work on it, but it was the first I'd heard of it. Oh, wow. Sure. Okay, okay. And how long ago was, I mean, how long before you started the story? Was that like right away? And then I started right researching it. Yeah, maybe a couple wow. of weeks. But, yeah. Oh, that's so cool, yeah. that's so cool. All right, now, since you finished writing the story, and it's obviously it's on the newsstands now, um, have you stayed involved in, in what's going on with Bitcoin or just I mean I have, I have a Bitcoin Google alert so mm -hmm. I am pretty you know I, I pretty much get the daily Aware. digest of what's going on yeah I also receive um, you know the Bitcoin My, Google group, group uh, yeah, yeah. digest Bitcoin so yeah group. I mean I'm generally up on it yeah. but I haven't been as immersed in it as right. I was yeah, yeah of course okay so um, all right I keep watching to see if my the coins are going to, you know, yeah. re regain the value they had when I bought them. But you Exactly. Know. So we'll talk about, I want to talk about that too. But, well, speaking of that, that's what I wanted to talk about is the title, The Rise and Fall of Bitcoin. The, you know, there's so much power in a title and uh, I don't know what, I'm making this number up, but I'm guessing at least half the people who see an article somewhere just read the title and, and don't have time to read the article. Question, did you come up with the title or was that assigned by... Yeah, I, I, did, I did not come up with a title, okay. but I also, um, I think it's a fair title. I mean, I think that, you know, a big point of a headline is to get people to read the story. So, right. you, you know, you're definitely going to err on the side of, like, you know, making it interesting, yeah. making it dramatic. Yeah. Having said that, I mean, if you look at Bitcoin just in terms of its valuation, it mm -hmm. clearly has had a dramatic rise and fall. I yeah. understand that there are people in the community who might object to saying that it has fallen because it's still... Here and they view the rise as a bubble in the first place. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I don't think that fall means death. You know, it's not right. the rise and death of Bitcoin. Right. And it could be the next chapter could be another rise. But yeah. I do think that in certain pretty important senses, there has been a fall. Right. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know? So that, the only reason I ask is, well, because of that, you basically said it, is that um, it can be read, and I guess that's the, the cleverness of a title, that it makes it newsy, that it's like, oh, it's dramatic and whatever. And uh, does that mean it's dead or does that mean the price rose and fell? And how you could take it more than one way. Sure. Uh, obviously, the price has risen, risen and fallen. Um, so on that level, there's there's that issue, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then the other is uh, like 
the death of Bitcoin. But obviously, it's not dead. Obviously, I, it's not dead. Right, right. right. I mean, there's certainly, I, I think there are some other ways in which you could say there's been a rise and fall, certainly in terms of media, you know, mm-hmm. exposure and interest. I think there was a rise and fall. I mean, there was a real intense sort of media um, moment Frenzy. for Bitcoin yeah. that has kind of receded. Um, and probably the, the um, breadth and diversity of people interested in Bitcoin is not what it was at that height. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think there were people who came in as speculators who maybe have now you know, retreated from the market, and now it's really, in some ways, it's maybe a healthier, more solid, just group of people who mm-hmm. are, you know, really interested in building Bitcoin and aren't yeah. interested in the kind speculating, of the, gambling, in, in sort of the daily moves of it. Yeah. You know? So yeah, and that's another question: is that do you think that the media frenzy was a result of the price going up from the speculation, or do you think the speculation was a result of the media frenzy, or is it a chicken and egg? Kind I of think thing? it's a, a spiral. I mean, <laughs> I think you know, thing. certain you can definitely track certain spikes in the price to media events. Like mm-hmm. there was a Forbes story online that caused the price to I think triple yeah. or or more, actually much more than triple. I think it went up like. 10 or 20 fold. Then Gawker had that story about Silk Road that caused it to triple again to 30. Um, but every time that that happened, it just caused more and more you know, yeah. press attention. And then the spiral works in reverse on the way down. Right. You know, when it starts falling, then there's a, story, a negative story, and then right. that causes and, you know. More negative. That's yeah. true. I think you're absolutely right. In fact, I'm, I've been, you know, I usually don't obsess about the price or anything. And people ask me, what's the price of Bitcoin today? And I'm like, I don't know. I only check when you ask me, you know. What is and the price so of Bitcoin today? It's interesting because I just pulled it up on my little widget. And I have noticed that since the Wired story, Every time I've checked, it hasn't. It's been higher than the previous time. Okay, it's not going up like like thirty times its value, but um, I think it was two twenty something, and then two thirty something, then two forty something, and then two forty eight this morning. Now it's two fifty three. So <laughs> I like that. Actually, I like that slower, steadier growth. Right. Um, speaking of the of the the value of Bitcoin, you know, actually, I, I was re- I was rereading the article this morning on the way in, and um, the quote where I said that you know this is definitely not a stock. It's it seems like it's just going to go up, up, up. Um, obviously, speculation makes it go up and down, you know, like a roller coaster. But um, I still kind of stand by the basic premise. But here's the thing: when the the price of Bitcoin, uh, the value of Bitcoin goes up and down and up and down and up and down. Obviously, all that noise. Uh, up and down is speculation, obviously. I mean, what else could it be? Um, but if you take the bottoms, like every time it drops, and then you connect the dots of the bottoms, and you may just make that curve of the bottom value, that's the more realistic value. Hmm. And going from six cents to what it is now, two dollars and fifty-three cents in one year, something like forty-nine hundred percent. So that's the thing I remind people that. True, it's gone to thirty dollars, but that's all speculation noise. Don't buy it when it's high. Hello, right. um, buy it when it's low. Connect the dots when it's low. Don't buy it as a one month investment or a three month investment. Think of it as a lifetime investment. And if you're going to invest in it, is this is what the, how I view it. And also, um, the you know the fact that gold went up twenty five percent last year, silver went up fifty percent, and Bitcoin went up forty nine hundred percent or whatever, depending on how you calculate it. It's still an amazing investment. It's just people who bought it when it was twenty dollars or something are going to be not. They're not going to look at it that way when it's two dollars. But um, it's it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting thing. Do you think that there's going to be continuing speculation, or do you think it's it's really stabilized and it's going to be a real steady growth curve from this point on? I mean, I feel given how volatile it's been so far, I can't imagine that people who are doing it purely for speculation are going to rush in now because they've seen what can happen with it. Yeah. I mean, were it to undergo another dramatic spurt and you know go back up to 30 in a short time, I'm sure a whole new set of people would be attracted to thinking, hey, this is you know a get-rich-quick scheme. Mm-hmm. But I would think that now the people who buy it are going to buy it because they want to use it, they want to take part in this community, they want to you know take part in this currency. But um, I, I would I would think that a, a lot fewer people would be inclined to do what Rick Falkving uh, of the Swedish Pirate Party did, which was at least what he said savings. he was going to do was put his entire life savings into Bitcoin. I think you know a, a more prudent approach might be to put some of your money into Bitcoin yeah. and still leave some of yours in the traditional banking system. Yeah, it, I wonder if uh, if we know uh, what the value, what the price of Bitcoin was when he wrote that article, or what he if he did. It was actually, definitely he's definitely lost money if he put his money yeah, in then. I mean, I don't remember. Yeah. Was it? I, I think it might have been. I don't know if it was at thirty. It might have already 
come wow. down a bit, but it was maybe it was in, in the twenties. I don't know. Yeah, it was probably before that. Yeah, interesting. Well, anyway, hey. I hope he left it in there and it keeps <laughs> growing because uh, I, I, I mean, my opinion is that it will, it'll go back up again. But it's just crazy to to triple, you know, in a week. And it, actually, there was a long period of time where it was averaging out, doubling, per, you know, doubling every mm. week. If you if you calculate it out, it's crazy, it's crazy, insane growth. But that's always a red flag, you know, like when anything, when Yahoo stock did that or Google stock did that, it's like really you know, dangerous time. But it's it's like day trading, it's like anything, you know, speculative. But um, it's very, very prudent to just look at the lows, in my opinion. Hmm. So what about, uh, okay, then the other issue is security, obviously, with uh, it being cash-like, it's a whole new thing of electronic cash is different than any other kind of cash we've ever had, where there's a central, uh, dis, you know, a central, you know, distribution point that can reverse transactions and prosecute people for doing things that are wrong. Um, it's not easy to do with Bitcoin. That's the whole point of it: is that it's decentralized, and uh, it really, literally, is like gold. You can steal it, run off, and it's gone. So, um, between the bank heists of my Bitcoin and the and Bitcoin Seven, you know about that? No. Yeah, What's Bitcoin Seven. <laughs> it's. A, I heard that it disappeared and took everybody's money. Another online wallet service. It's, it's actually well. It's an. It was an exchange site. Hmm. You know, there were red flags when the first site, when the site came up and um, another exchange site accused them of copying and pasting all the text. It was just like, uh, really sketchy. Oh, and then the worst thing actually was before that when they were contact, they contacted me. They emailed a lot of the key people in the forum and key people in the Bitcoin community and, and offered to pay us to say good things about it. And I was like, oh my gosh. That, I, I posted the email that they, that they sent to me and I'm like, this sounds sketchy. And um, sure enough, apparently, I, I heard that they uh, shut down and kept everybody's money. So that's going to happen. And now e-wallets are springing up like weeds all over the place. So it, you, it's sure to happen a lot more. Right. Um, I moved my money off of. I mean, I, I only bought you know not a lot of not a lot of bitcoins, but enough to play with. And I I used to keep them in an exchange, and I, I moved them into into a you know personal offline. desktop solution. Yeah. Uh, just because. You know, yeah. there's just too many of these exchanges have had problems. You got to make sure that it's not um, like Windows or, I mean, even Mac is going to, they're going to, viruses are going right. to show up. Viruses are already in the wild in Windows that will grab and steal your wallet. Right. Now, the new version of, uh, the, the, which leads to the next thing, the security as far as application development, it hasn't been as fast as I anticipated because I thought, you know, within a month or two or three, hmm. uh, it's going to be here. But it is. It's they're coming, and so uh, in the next couple episodes, we're going to be uh, demonstrating some of these new apps that actually are super, super sophisticated. They'll <clears throat> the standard Bitcoin client now encrypts your wallet. Um, there have been some uh, bugs that they're working out with that, but you know, uh, it's it's anyway, it's it's in development. That's the standard client, but now there are some other open source clients which actually do more. They encrypt your wallet from the beginning, and then they back up an encrypted copy to a server um, uh, using a, this standard server, which is all open source software. So you can pick the server you trust, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter because the whole thing is encrypted anyway. So it's all free open source software, and it's encrypted anyway before it's backed up. So literally, if you have your app on your phone, or your laptop, you could drop your laptop or your phone in the lake, and it wouldn't matter. You could, I mean, in the sense that you could retrieve that as right. long as you remember the, you know, your secret password you print out and have at home. Right. So it's really smart, smart software that's come coming. So um, I believe it's just like in in a couple days it'll be available. Hmm. So between you know the media attention of Wired magazine, your story, and these new apps finally coming to to market, I think that. Uh, Bitcoin's time is actually still yet to come. I think it's going to be interesting. So what, what was the most um, intriguing part of the, the research that you did? I mean, I think the, the most interesting thing to me was just the amount of creativity because this entirely new economy was being created. And so there's just all these people doing such neat things. Like, you know, whether it's an entirely new, you know, TV show about this thing or, <laughs> you know, Mark Soups in, in Brooklyn who's, you know, creating a Bitcoin ATM or... You know, people talking about bitcoins as collectibles, and you know, trading. You know, with the Genesis block, fetch, uh, you know, numismatic value of bitcoins. <laughs> Crazy. Um, you know, even stuff like Silk Road and the black. You know, the tour sites. I mean, that's pretty fascinating to see these mm -hmm. sort of black markets arise that use bitcoins. So all of those, 
all of these things, um, it's almost just watching like a new world come into being, you know? Yeah. It reminds me of, I lived in the Czech Republic after the fall of communism and it was like, you know, they were just tra transitioning to this entirely new way of being and all, all the institutions and businesses and sort of ways of living and working that we take for granted were, had to be kind of created from scratch and mm -hmm. there's just a lot of dynamism and you know, brain power and creativity that become, makes it really interesting. And form follows functions or whenever yeah. there's a need and people coming up with creative ideas. It's true and you, I love, that's why I love traveling because you go to different cultures and different economies and, you, and you, you get ideas of, wow, look how they sell things like in this place. This is a convenient way to do it. We should do that. And yeah, the brainstorming, it's, it's really cool. We did, uh, I think it was the last episode we did um, on this site called Bets of Bitcoin, which is another innovative thing. Uh, it's where you can, and that, there's more than one, but this particular one, you can put any statement you want <laughs> and then bet on it. And uh, it's obviously gambling, but then again, it's Bitcoin. So as the founder was pointing out, you know, it may not be technically illegal because it's just, legally speaking, it's mm. funny money. It's just digits we're betting for. It's like, right. like play money, like monopoly money. So uh, we'll see how that <laughs> pans out. But it's interesting, though, another thing you can do with it. You can just bet, you can put any statement you want on who's going to get elected or what sports team is going to win or if it's going to rain on Friday, anything you what want. What Bitcoin's going to be worth in 10 years. Yeah, yeah. right, exactly, so. exactly. The ten, uh, your, your article reminded me of the 10,000 Bitcoins spent on two pizzas. Oh my god. Yeah, gosh. the hundred and, you know, or what was it, the 200 and something thousand dollar pizza, pepperoni yeah. pizza? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah 280, 287 or something. I know. Crazy, crazy. Um, and then, of course, now it's gone way down, so it's only, you know, whatever, $30,000 pizza. Right. I know, that's, <laughs> that's crazy. It's still a $30,000 pizza. I know, right? <laughs> even, even so, it's much more realistic, uh, the current price. So what else? Do you have, okay, so after all of your extensive research and interviews and all that, um, who do you really think Satoshi is? Believe me, I, I mean, you know, I know a lot of people think it's sort of silly to be so interested in who Satoshi is, and some people think it's unimportant, and some people think, you know, leave the guy alone. And I say, you know, it's human, in, human nature to be, to be intrigued by a mystery. Yeah. Satoshi made himself mysterious. You know, I, I say, you know, it's fair game, and I would love to know who Satoshi is. I tried, you know, my darndest to, to, to figure it out. I talked to as many you know, sort of smart people as I could who might know something about it. I talked to all the people who had been named as suspects and they all denied it. And in general, if someone flat out denies it, I, I assume they're telling the truth. Um, I mean, I, all I can say is what I ended up with, which was more of a profile of who Satoshi might be mm -hmm. than a name or a job or a company. And again, based on what these other more informed people said, including some of the developers of Bitcoin, um, this profile suggests it's an, someone with academic training, but not necessarily a PhD, maybe just a master's. Someone probably who's British in origin, or at least speaks British English. Um, possibly someone around the age of 50 based on their style of programming notation. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, I really have no idea. I mean, I, I'm pretty confident it's not a Japanese person in spite of his name. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. Do you know? <laughs> no, no, I don't know. <laughs> I'll be quick to deny that I know. But yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I think the your profile is sounds accurate yeah. from what I've learned and heard and whatever. But then again, we've heard the same things. The um, did you read the New Yorker article where he I did, really yes. went into? Do you yeah. do you uh, overall do you agree with his assessment of who he thinks it is? Well, he named specific person, and that specific person has denied right. emphatically that it's him mm -hmm. and. Again, I, I you know I'll take him at his word, and so I assume that's not the person. And yeah. so, you know, I don't think that um, there have been a few other attempts to figure out who it is. Mm -hmm. and I don't think anyone has really managed to put their finger on the right person. Mm -hmm. And if you did, if if you accidentally found out who it was, would you would you publish that? Would you t would you add, would you tell people? Um, unless there was some compelling reason not to, I think I you would? I would. I mean, Satoshi mm -hmm. Nakamoto has you know. Is, is, has done something in public, created a very um, public phenomenon, um, kind of an important, significant phenomenon. Um, I'm not sure that I would necessarily think that Satoshi Nakamoto's right to privacy would trump public interest in who Satoshi Nakamoto is. But you know, I would take it on a, you know, I, I would what look you, at the specifics and if may, maybe to you? there's it, something I haven't thought you? about that would make make it compelling to not disclose his identity. What if you found out that you knew who he was and he asked you not to disclose it? 
It would depend why, why he asked me. I mean, it would really depend on the specifics of the yeah. case. I mean, I wouldn't want to be a total hardliner, you know, if he, if he convinced me there was a good reason good to reason. keep his identity. But, you know, I, I don't know. I'm a journalist. My yeah. job is to, is to reveal secrets, not conceal uh, them. Okay. You know? Which doesn't mean I never exercise discretion. Okay. You hear that, yeah. Satoshi? So... Be careful, watch journalists. It. Watch, yeah. it. watch it, Satoshi. Watch yourself around journalists. Watch your back. <laughs> exactly. So I want to uh, remind the audience we're broadcasting live now. And so if you have a question for Benjamin or me, uh, you can text message it right now to 646-580-0099 if you're watching live or you can do it anytime, 24-7, and we'll, we'll try to address your questions on the next episode. But if you do it right now live, we might be able to answer it right here on the show. So it's uh, send a text message, SMS, to 646-580-0099, that's a USA number, plus one, and, or send an email to feedback at onlyonetv.com. That's feedback at onlyonetv.com, all spelled out. Now, take a, this is a good time to uh, take a quick break and thank our sponsors, obviously, who uh, bring us to you. And uh, so first we'd like to thank Mt. Gox. Mt. Gox, obviously, everybody knows who Mt. Gox is. They are the de facto place to buy and sell Bitcoin online. Uh, you, you can buy Bitcoins um, and sell Bitcoins back and forth for uh, more than 16 currencies anywhere on the planet, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's an auto, it is the automated online exchange site to buy and sell Bitcoin. Um, they have super security. They have been around the longest. They have been hacked famously, but they are very resilient. They came back. Nobody lost any Bitcoins in any of the hacks either, by the way, except Mt. Gox lost a few. But the, no, but no account holders actually lost any money, which is very good. Um, they, uh, and they, they didn't run away and you know, disappear. They're still here. <laughs> so there's that. And also, they have um, the state-of-the-art in two-factor authentication. They have a little key ring dongle called the USB key, it's, uh, I mean, sorry, it's a USB key called a UB key, Y-U-B-I-K-E-Y, and on mountgox.com you can just click uh, send me a UB key. And what that does is it gives you a, you, you plug this little USB thing in and it gives you a secret password that is only good for two seconds, I think, or two minutes, I forget. Anyway, the point is that even a keyboard capture virus can capture it all at once and it, they won't be able to get into your account, so it gives you um, the state of the art in security. So again, Mt. Gox is, uh, or otherwise known as M.T. Gox, however you want to pronounce it, it's mtgox.com. We thank Mt. Gox for sponsoring the Bitcoin show. And Thank You Economy by New York Times bestselling author Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary Vaynerchuk you may know as Gary V on Twitter. He's very famous in social media and Twitter and all that. Um, he uh, is an, an entrepreneur. He took over his family's liquor business, turned it into a huge wine store um, online as well as uh, brick and mortar. And um, he's uh, now written his second book, which is all about how to turn your business, your brand, into uh, to leverage the state of the art in, again, social media. So uh, Twitter, Facebook, and this, this age of the internet, to use that uh, to bring your business the customer service of yesteryear, like your grandparents' experience from the corner store. So um, it doesn't matter if your business is small, medium, or very, very large. It's totally scalable. And this is kind of the Bible in how to do that. It's an excellent book. Gary is young but brilliant, brilliant guy. I've been a huge fan of his way before he became a sponsor. So uh, check it out, thankyoeconomybook.com. It's thankyoeconomybook.com, and uh, read all about it. And uh, love you, Gary Vaynerchuk, big fan. And MemoryDealers.com. You know, Roger Ver, the founder of MemoryDealers.com, I, I gave him the nickname Bitcoin Jesus. He is such a Bitcoin evangelist. And uh, MemoryDealers.com is one of the largest retailers in the world that accepts Bitcoin and promotes Bitcoin, too. Um, they uh, are famous for being one of the largest inventories of fiber optic networking devices, uh, switches, routers, anything, any kind of device that could have anything to do with networking infrastructure, as well as, of course, all types of memory and even Bitcoin mining gear, all, si all sorts of stuff. But check it out, Bitcoin, I'm sorry, <laughs> memorydealers.com. I always see the big Bitcoin logo there, and I want to say Bitcoin, but it's memorydealers.com, and they even sell physical forms of Bitcoin, which you can buy with credit cards and PayPal, which is another interesting twist. So uh, anyway, check out memorydealers.com, and we thank uh, Roger Ver, the 
founder and CEO of Memory Dealers for, for his sponsorship of the Bitcoin show. And we're back. So let's see. Let's check and see if we have any, um, um, any questions. So what would you like to, uh, to tell the audience? What would you like to say that uh, you haven't already said? in your uh, article. You said it all in your article. I said it all because, you know, I think I was mentioning to you earlier, um, I mean, obviously I'm thrilled to have any members of the Bitcoin community read this article, but it really was for everyone uh, not the in rest the Bitcoin of the community. It was about the Bitcoin community. And so I think, you know, if you're in the Bitcoin community, you might uh, find this to be a good uh, sort of summary of everything you've already experienced. Mm -hmm. But for people who aren't in the community, it, it might introduce them to Bitcoin and sort of tell them the, the short history of it mm -hmm. and all. Yeah. It's very eventful, short history. Kind of like a massive Wikipedia you know. of the, li the, the yeah. life of Bitcoin to date. Something like that. So what does the future hold? If you're, if you, if you're gonna write another article two years from now, the continuation of Bitcoin, what, what will it say? What do you predict? You know, if I knew, I would know whether to <laughs> sell, <laughs> sell my it. Bitcoins or, or buy more. more. Um, <laughs> I think it's, high, you know, it's very unpredictable. I mean, my, my hunch for Bitcoin is that it's going to do what I think it has already done somewhat, which is basically find its niche. Like I don't see Bitcoin personally as overturning the Western financial system. I see it as, you know, occupying a val valuable small niche, um, but a, you know, a very valuable small niche uh, among people who believe in it and who can use it for certain types of transactions that it really is better than the traditional currency at. Mm -hmm. I mean, in general, I don't, I don't think it's a solution I think someone said, you know, it's a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. And I think to some degree that's true. Like, you, you can fault the banking system, you can fault central banking, you can talk about, you know, all the issues of money supply and, and big government and all of that, but basically it works. It works, mm -hmm. you know, with its problems, it works. And, yeah. and there's, as one uh, digital currency kind of pioneer said to me, there's an entire trust fabric uh, based on legal mechanisms. And mm -hmm. that's very important. And Bitcoin doesn't necessarily have that. But, you know, I, I actually think, even though I think sometimes, you know, Bitcoin people don't like to have so much attention paid to the black market uses of it, I think that's actually a great use for Bitcoin. I mean, <laughs> it's a perfect use for Bitcoin. And, it, and mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a... It's a big economy. It's a, it's, is it a big... I mean... Is, well, it, of course, you know... Uh, when you talk, I mean, drugs, come on, drugs and gambling and whatever, look at the mob. I right, mean, it's right. a huge economy. Right. You can't deny right. that. And I'm not in any way suggesting that I, you know, hope that someone will, you know, buy a, 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 an assassination contract no. using Bitcoins. But for some of, you know, for, for, for some sort of more harmless, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, gray activity, I don't, I, I think Bitcoin's a, a good, a good, mm -hmm. uh, uh, ha, ha, that's, a good, privacy. that's a great use for, for mm -hmm. Bitcoin. I think a great use for Bitcoin is transactions across borders into countries where there's repression like mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think Bitcoin is going to find all these niche uses that it does better than anything yeah. else that's out there. Yeah, I mean, it, it are, that, that's already true. Like, um, for sure, it's the cheapest way to send money to China, for example, things like that. I mean, it's the cheapest way to send money anywhere, really. But... Um, the, there are lots of advantages that everybody are, is quick to point out. Um, a lot of them may be political or philosophical, like you say, freedom, liberty-minded, all that. Um, and also there's the gray and black market and all that, which, I mean, that, that's just common sense. I mean, I'm not a, I don't really do anything that's even gray market, but, um, but, but it's common sense that when Gawker published the thing, the article about um, Silk Road, um, the price tripled, right, or something like yep. that. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, everybody has a little sense, knows that that there's an economy there, and that right. there is a use. But, um, but what's you know, they talk about apps on a platform, and then there's the killer app. I think that the benefit there's all these benefits of Bitcoin, but there's the killer benefit. And to me, I think the killer benefit is one that most Bitcoiners. Uh, underplay, undervalue, under, under talk about. And that is um, $45 billion a year is spent each year in the U.S. alone on, do you know? No. Credit card fees. Merchants hmm. pay credit card fees every time they accept MasterCard, Visa, and forget PayPal. It's crazy. So um, a, t a total is, uh, I read this on Dwala, so we'll use them as a resource, but uh, they say $45 billion a year, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is just in the U.S. just on credit card fees alone. Now that's one thing, and then you, on top of that, you've got chargebacks six months later and all that. Now, like you said, people PayPal is really easy. You click, click, go, you buy, whatever. I mean, it does work, 
um, most of the time, if you overlook the exorbitant fees and you like grumble about them, but you do it anyway, and um, you know they, they close your account in season, keep all your money twice, that's happened to me, and you, you're really, really pissed, but it really does work. You're right, and it exists, and there is that infrastructure, and people accept it and all that. And so if someone you know, misuses your credit card information, the credit card company generally makes you whole. So mm -hmm. there's some protection there right. that you don't have with Bitcoin. You know, if you, I mean, I just don't see like a non-technical user anytime soon getting into Bitcoin. Right. Because it's just too hard. There's too much friction. Even if it becomes easier in one step, that's still like a step beyond what people currently have to take. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, okay, so the, here's, here's what I think. The, the, the killer app, if you will, is the, the transaction fees being virtually zero and the uh, it being cash-like, financial privacy, not traceable, you know, publicly like everything else is, not identity-related. Like when you order something online, you have to prove that you are Ben Wallace or else they won't sell you something. But with this, the only thing they know is did you pay or did you not pay? Right. And where do you want it sent? Right. You know, or whatever it is. Right. That's the only thing they care about. So there's no such thing as, as identity theft. I mean, all that's over. It's, it really seems like the future. But this idea hit me the other day. I'm sure I'm not the first one with it. But that oh the other but the problem the downside of all that is the currency risk they call it the the value the value of Bitcoin mm -hmm. fluctuating, so here's the idea that I thought of like I said I'm sure I'm not the first one to think of it, but what if <laughs> um, Bitcoin is not the thing that you use to buy lunch, you get paid you get your paycheck in dollars and the restaurant needs dollars to buy their produce that week right, but it's the intermediary I think of it as the Star Trek teleportation thing you get on the platform and you get you know uh, disintegrated into atomic energy or whatever and then you get rebuilt again on the other side imagine if your dollars get with one click get converted into Bitcoin it doesn't matter what the value is because your dollars your 1285 dollars get converted into Bitcoin boom sent and then they get immediately converted back into dollars again and what happened then is that first of all the transaction fee is virtually zero and the currency value doesn't even matter. It could be two cents of Bitcoin or $200 of Bitcoin, it doesn't even matter because it's converted, converted. And so it's very stable. You still have the financial privacy because we, we don't know where you sent it. You just converted it to Bitcoins and sent it. You know? hmm. So you have the zero transaction, virtually zero transaction, the irreversible nature of it, the no chargebacks, no credit card fees, and privacy. You have all the benefits but you and you have no currency risk. So I think that's going to be the solution. I think that there, the, these new apps are going to make it one button, send $12.50, boom, hmm. received $12.50. So, I mean, there's still banking involved because it's going to have to go, well, not necessarily. Or exchange or someone, yeah. some intermediary. But, Something yeah. like, and the, it, somehow you have to get the dollars in. But, right. but if, it's, if it's Mt. Gox, for example, you can have U.S. dollars in your Mt. Gox account. Right. And uh, it's still dollars. And it doesn't actually, once it's in Mt. Gox, it doesn't involve any banking. Right. I mean, one, I will say one of the sort of philosophically interesting things to me about Bitcoin and what was really interesting about working on it mm -hmm. was just there seems to be some, you know, latent widespread desire to eliminate the need for trust in the world. Like people have like trust issues or something and they want, mm -hmm. you know, they don't trust the government, they don't trust the bank and Bitcoin is somehow an answer to this and if you use Bitcoin you don't need to trust those people. But, you know, as I think this is one of the focuses of my article is that there's always someone you need to trust, whether it's the exchange, whether it's the merchant. <laughs> you can't remove the need for trust from the system. And mm -hmm. so, um, I don't know, I do think Bitcoin is some sort of attempt to displace you know, that need for trust, but as you know, my, my Bitcoin showed, you know, a fly-by-night hmm. internet storefront is not necessarily more trustworthy than the Federal Reserve. Right, exactly. But the smart people didn't keep their money in my Bitcoin either. They knew better. Smart people did keep their well, money in my true. Bitcoin. And I mean, look at, you know, Stefan Thomas. I mean, Gavin one of the smartest guys. I mean, yeah. no, I mean, so, you know, such smart people. Yeah. And he, he wasn't in my Bitcoin, but he, you know, he just, he lost his, his uh, oh. password for his own desktop yeah. wallet. And then some of the other ones, I think he misplaced the wallet. I mean, it's so easy at this there point. There was a Dropbox it, issue. Or you know, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Dropbox overwrote the file with the same name. And, ah, right. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, hurt, the, yeah. you know, the people involved in Bitcoin couldn't be smarter, and yeah. even they have problems. Yeah. You know? This early pain, I think we're going to look back at it like the early attempts to create a light bulb, you know. I think that the early pain is what, where the, the develop, well, look, Stefan Thomas is who we're going to have on, the, you know, the next episode, because we're going to talk about, or the one after next, I think. Anyway, uh, about his new pro newest project, 
projects and stuff. He's the one who created the server side. Like there's a whole bunch of new um, client apps that, you know, I was telling you, they back up and, I mean, they encrypt the wallet locally and then they back it up on the server. He created mm -hmm. the server side and there's like uh, two or three or six apps that all use the same server engine. He created that. And so um, out of his pain has the, this, hmm. you know, this phoenix has arisen of, of a new technology that is, I'm sure, you know, you have a real passionate interest in do, making sure this doesn't happen to anybody else. Sure. Just like me, I'm such an advocate for security also because of what happened to me. So, um, uh, where was I going to go with that? Um, the, so these new apps, I think that that's the way it is and that's the way it has been, but I see what's coming and as really changing, real game changers. Because when, if these Android apps and, and even iPhone web-based apps they're working on, um, you can literally put in a dollar amount, US dollar amount, hit go, and it sends it through the Bitcoin network. And then the person on the mm. other end, the restaurant or merchant or whatever can receive it, boom, as US dollars into their Mount, whether it's their Mt. Gox account or whatever it is, right. they, um, this will make it so, so easy to do. And all the benefits, ease of use, security, right. so that nobody ever loses it again. You know, like you're saying, there, there's the theft issue. Um, and you were talking about trust issue. That's what you're talking about, trust. Well, the thing, <laughs> the people, it seems like the people we trust the least are the governments and the banks, probably the, the banks who then own the government. But uh, those two entities, you know, we just have absolutely no control over at all. And they're probably the least trusted of, of, the, of all these potential parties. And so that's the one thing Bitcoin does sort of eliminate. Um, Buyers and sellers have to trust each other. If, if, if I'm buying I, something from I trust, cash... I trust my bank and I trust the U.S. government more than I trust Tom Williams. Well, that's true. That's the thing. But, the, well, once again, Tom Williams was a bank. That was a bank. It was basically right, a Bitcoin bank. So, I mean, it's like, you know, they have these know your customer laws. I say, well, know your banker is even more important than them knowing their customer. You're the one giving them the money. But Tom, but Tom Williams is not subject to FDIC. He's not subject to government regulation. Exactly. So that's why... You know, I'm not, exactly. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit of a traditionalist in that I'm, I recognize there are huge problems with our banking system and with our government, but it's still better than the alternative, which is mm -hmm. anarchy and people just fly by night businesses that don't, have yeah. no regulation. Yeah, that's, well, okay, yeah. There's, a, you know, regulation is one of those tricky words, that, and I, it, it's like love. It's like you could be taken way many different ways, but um, regulation is, um, I mean, even the most liberty-minded people are pro-regulation when it comes to uh, eliminating monopolies, for example. So regulation depends on what kind of regulation and what are you regulating and all that stuff. It's just such a vague term. But, but I see what you're saying. The, obviously, you know, you, <laughs> you don't trust a stranger. I mean, that just goes without saying. So that, my Bitcoin is a bad, it's sort of, a, I mean, it's, a, it's obviously an example we had to learn. It's, it's a, what do you call it, a wildcat bank. Pain or, or, yeah, oh, it's like the wild, wild right. west with a, right. a wildcat banks. You put up a sign bank and then you take everybody's money for six months and then skip town. I mean, this is something we had to learn that, oh, that's right. This is not a traceable credit card thing that can be reversed. This is cash. So we all got, whoever got burned. But um, the, okay, so aside from that issue, the, with the current state of it, assuming we've learned that lesson, we still have to trust. The buyer has to trust the seller or the seller has to trust the buyer. The, I mean, if I'm buying something cash, if I'm buying, you know, whatever. So you, you made some handcrafted leather good and I'm buying it for a uh, briefcase for cash, then I have to trust you're going to send me the briefcase and I'm going to send you the cash. Right. We either meet in person and we do it at the same time or, you know, I have to make sure that the cash is real, whatever. There's, there's always trust. So I always say don't ever do business with somebody you don't trust. Like, that's easier said than done, though, especially, you know, in the gray market or something. You don't know, you don't trust anybody. And online, you don't know who, who you're dealing with. But, um, so there's where Bitcoin, we always have to remember it's cash-like because when you... Uh, if you're selling something, it eliminates the need to trust because they're sending you cash and you've got the, you got the Bitcoin, you know you got it. But the buyer has to trust you. So that's why there's these you know, escrow services have sprung up and different things like that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a different way of doing business. But um, in general, I think that usually when there's uh, things being sold online, there's a merchant that has many customers. It's a one-to-many relationship with the merchant having many customers. And if you're, I mean, it's different. Craigslist one-to-one -one is different, and that's going to be tricky. But, hmm. and then you're going to have to have reputation and escrow and all that. And you still might get burned. But if there's a merchant, an online store, then it's less likely um, that 
the store is going to rip you off. It's not impossible, but it's, it's a little bit less likely because they have a reputation to uphold. Right. A, a random customer is just, they don't know you from Adam. But the idea then is the customer sends the, the payment, then the store responds with the products and the store maintains its reputation. The customer doesn't have to worry about a reputation because nobody knows them. Right. So that's, that's a good thing. With, um, with credit cards and, and PayPal, the stores get ripped off. The merchants get ripped off. I think the merchants should be the biggest advocates of Bitcoin because mm. merchants get ripped off constantly. People reverse credit card charges six months later, five months later, and say that they um, they say that they're um, I, I was never in New York. I don't know what you're talking about. Whatever. And American Express says, well, they're a platinum card customer. We always side with them. It doesn't matter what the facts are. Right. You could have their thumbprint and their a notarized contract. Doesn't matter. Mm. You know. So merchants get screwed. Really, huh. <laughs> they do, and so I think right. merchants, sh you know, should be a huge advocate of Bitcoin. Hmm. And if you can, if we can, if these apps, these new apps, can tie it in so that there's absolute security. And speaking of trust, ver you know, banks and institutions and all that, I think people, tr people say, you know, in cryptography we trust. You've seen that slogan. Mm -hmm. I think that we trust in Bitcoin's cryptography and the free open source software mm -hmm. part of mm -hmm. it. So if these apps, mm -hmm. especially if the apps are free open source software, and everybody can see the source code and we know that, that it is what it says it is, right. that people, I, that's probably the most trustworthy thing other than yourself, which you can't even trust mm -hmm. yourself. Some people need to be tr protected from themselves. Absolutely. Even yeah. these technologists, yeah. like we were saying. So, um, so do you see more, um, more merchants and retailers just in this, the New York area using Bitcoin? I mean, not I lately. Like, like yeah. you say, there's been a there's been a waning interest in it. Um, it's, it all has to do with the value. You know, when the value is going up, everybody's it's everybody's in a in a buzz about it, and then mm. the value going up makes the media attention, which makes it go up and all that. And then, like you say, it spirals up. Um, speculation and all that, mm. uh, and media interest makes more merchants interested. But, um, so I think it's gonna be slow. I think it's gonna be a more slow, natural, organic growth, mm. which is actually good. I think people who really understand Bitcoin think that that's a good thing. Because if it, goes, if it grows like, exponentially and explodes, it's dangerous. Right. It's much better to be slow and steady, like a, like a business growing. It's much better to be slow and steady, slow and steady, plodding along in its growth. Um, the way MasterCard and Visa did. Do you, you're not old enough to remember, but I remember when stores didn't take MasterCard and Visa. It was a real mm. exception to have a logo, mm. a great big logo, right. and it wasn't both. It was one or the other. They were competing, you know, and there were several Maybe others, diners, diners club, yeah. and all that. Yeah, there would yeah. be a big thing, MasterCard, you know, and uh, it was a real exceptional thing to find a place that took a credit card, mm. uh, especially a standardized credit card that was more than one store, because every like. Uh, Macy's, whatever, you know, department stores had their own credit card. They kind of started, I think, started the thing. And then they be, then this MasterCard and what came along, and then later Visa mm -hmm. and so on. And it was really an exceptional thing, and it took many, many, many years for that to catch on. Um, and it was only credit, of course, way before debit. But the point is that if, I mean, I don't, I don't want Bitcoin to d grow that slowly, but if it grows more organically and slowly mm -hmm. and steadily, I think it will be better and healthier, and people will be able to, to trust it more. The apps are going to mature very quickly, you know, I mean, it's kind of like civil rights. I mean, you say it's really, really, things are changing fast, but not fast enough. That's it. Hmm. It's growing fast, but not fast enough. And it's kind of a crazy thing. When you look back at how much things have changed in civil rights, for example, and uh, for, for African Americans and for and gay rights and things like that, if you look back 10 years, you look back 20 years, wow, it's amazing how much it's changed but not fast enough. It couldn't mm. be fast enough. Yeah. Same thing with Bitcoin. I mean, we, I would love for every, every retailer to accept Bitcoin online and offline, brick and mortar and everything, but the, uh, these things have to be solved. And I th a lot of it has to do with the software development, which is ready. I think it's just about ready now mm. because it had to address security, um, which I think these do now, and it has to address um, the currency risk, which I think these things do because you can convert dollars to Bitcoins, Bitcoins to dollars instantly. Mm. And... Um, with those two things in place, and then more and more ease of use, I think that uh, I think it will spread fast. <laughs> That's going to be very interesting to watch. Hopefully, it won't go yeah. you know from two dollars to thirty dollars and then back again you know repeatedly. But it, it probably will. Who knows? Who knows? As more and more people talk about it. So, well, thank. We have to do this again for sure. Yeah. Well, Thanks we, for having me, Bruce. We shouldn't wait another year. We have to do this you know more often and and uh, see what's up. Great. Are you going to write any more stories about Bitcoin? 
Um, I mean, I don't have any assigned right now, but who knows? You know, okay. if, if a whole bunch more activity starts happening with it, conceivably. Okay. Well, stay in so, touch for oh sure. Well. Come to the meetups. Okay. Right. Thanks, Great. Ben. Thank you. All right. Bye. Take care. See you guys next time. Thanks for joining us.